So, hi everyone to our session this morning. Uh, we're going to have four talks today. Uh, just, but just before we get started, if anyone would like to uh, turn their camera on, uh, just so the speakers aren't talking to a, a blank wall, feel free to do that. Um, so we're going to have four talks today. Uh, and at three minutes, I may rudely interrupt them just to say they have three minutes left. Um, uh, and please post your questions on the on the chat. Uh, and uh, if there isn't time for them, you can ask them on the on the Slack afterwards. Uh, if we uh, run to time, we should be done at three ten uh, Central European time, so in about two hours ten minutes from now. Um, so if there's Anything else? We'll get started. So our first speaker is Aurora Caselli, who's going to be talking to us today about metal oxides and hydrides in exoplanet atmospheres. Great, thank you. And I will start sharing now. Okay, does that look good? Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you so much for organizing um, this conference. And I'm really excited uh, that you asked me to talk about this um, and to share um, my research and talk about um, the research that's been going on to look for metal oxides and metal hydrides in hot exoplanet atmospheres. And just as a really quick introduction, um, a metal oxide is just a molecule that has one metal, so maybe like iron, um, magnesium, something like that, plus a oxygen um, atom and a metal hydride is the same plus a hydrogen atom. And um, I'm a postdoc at Leiden Observatory. I forgot to say that at the beginning. <laughs> okay, so I know this is a talk about exoplanets, but I wanted to start by giving you an introduction to metal hydrides and metal oxides in low mass stars. And the reason that I wanted to start here is because um, we know the spectra of low mass stars a lot better than we know the spectra of exoplanets. And we know that the spectra of low mass stars are dominated by metal hydrides and metal oxides in the optical region. So here I'm showing the spectrum of a M, uh, sorry, yeah, of an M dwarf star. It has a temperature of 2,700 Kelvin. And here is a medium resolution optical spectrum where I have wavelength and just a normalized flux. And most of these wiggles that you see in the spectrum, they're not noise, they're actually absorption from molecules. And I've labeled all of the main molecules that we can detect in the visible. And all of these molecules um, happen to be metal oxides and metal hydrides. So we can detect um, magnesium hydride, calcium hydride, chromium hydride, and iron hydride, um, all within this region. And we also see lots of absorption from two metal hydrides, sorry, two metal oxides, and that's titanium oxide and vanadium oxide. So I've kind of labeled these features. And um, what you'll notice is that most of the features that I've labeled um, come from metal oxides and metal hydrides. And um, I actually did my PhD research on low mass stars. So uh, this conference is super great, I think, um, to get people uh, interested in changing fields. It's not impossible. Um, and uh, here's some really cool results that you can do with metal oxides and metal hydrides in low mass stars. And what we've learned is that you can probe lots of really cool parameters in low mass stars by measuring um, different features of metal oxides and metal hydrides. Um, and so you can use it to measure surface gravity, metallicity, um, cloud formation and cloud dispersion and weather um, in brown dwarfs and uh, magnetic field strengths are often measured by calculating Zeeman broadening um, in low mass stars um, in metal hydride and oxide bands. So here's an example from a paper that I did um, during my PhD thesis. And this is showing how you can use the calcium hydride to titanium oxide ratio to estimate the total metal content of the star. So all of these spectra have spectral type of M3, um, but they have different metal content. So at the top, 
we have solar metallicity and down at the bottom we have super low metallicity. So this is a um, metal to hydrogen ratio of minus 1.5 dex, which means 10 to the minus 1.5 um, times solar abundance, which is about 3%. Um, and you can see here's the calcium hydride band and it's pretty consistent um, at lower metallicities, but the titanium oxide band basically completely disappears. And so by measuring this ratio, you can estimate a, a metal content in the star. Um, you can also do a, make a similar plot uh, to calculate surface gravity. And instead of titanium oxide disappearing at surface, for surface gravity, um, actually the calcium hydride band is much more surface gravity dependent. Um, so there's lots of really cool things that we can do if we can measure uh, metal hydrides and metal oxides. Okay, so now on to the exoplanet part, now that I've told you about what we know metal oxides and hydrides do in low mass stars. And the reason that I started with low mass stars is because a lot of the hot Jupiters that we are able to measure atmospheres on um, have similar temperatures to low mass stars. So here's kind of a scale diagram just to explain why these planets have such high um, temperatures. So if you think of Earth um, at one AU, if we scale this circle down to Mercury's orbit, that's 0.4 AU. But the typical hot Jupiter is way closer than Mercury orbits our sun. It's at 0.05 AU. And um, they usually have equilibrium temperatures somewhere between 1000 and all the way up to the hottest known hot Jupiter that has an equilibrium temperature of about 4000 and that's Kelt 9. Um, so maybe as a uh, first idea, we might think that because hot Jupiters have similar temperatures to low mass stars, maybe they have similar atmospheres and similar molecules in the atmospheres as low mass stars. So <clears throat> ever since um, we have started looking at the atmospheres of hot Jupiters, people have thought about including opacity from metal hydrides and metal oxides. And um, once you start including this opacity from metal hydrides and metal oxides, um, you start to realize that they actually can have a large change on the atmosphere, even if they're only available or abundant in small um, volume mixing ratios. And so there's um, some nice papers by Hubini and uh, Fortney um, that go into uh, what adding metal oxides and metal hydrides to an atmosphere would do to the atmosphere. And um, it's basically thought to cause temperature inversions in the atmosphere. So here's a plot showing the pressure temperature profile of a hot Jupiter. So we have temperature here on the X axis and pressure on the Y axis. And so down at the bottom at the higher pressures, this is the bottom of the atmosphere. And so normally what we would expect is that deeper in the atmosphere, we would have higher temperatures. And as we go farther out in the atmosphere, we get lower temperatures. And um, I've plotted here some different pressure temperature profiles from models. And um, if you have, in this normal case, infrared opacity larger than optical opacity, which would happen if we have lots of water, um, which absorbs in the infrared, or methane, or other molecules like that, we would expect that to be true. Now, if you start to increase the optical opacity, which we expect to happen when we have all of this absorption from metal hydrides and metal op oxides in the optical part of the spectrum, you start to see an isothermal profile at the top of the um, atmosphere. And this can go to the extreme where we have more optical opacity than infrared opacity, and we start to see a temperature inversion. So what that means is, um, the temperature actually starts to increase as we go higher in the atmosphere in some cases. And so we've actually measured clear evidence that there are some temperature inversions in some hot Jupiters. And so kind of this, this makes it seem like, okay, they have the same temperatures as low mass stars and they have temperature inversions. So it seems like metal oxides and metal hydrides should be present in hot Jupiter atmospheres. Um, and so now I'm going to go through kind of how we detect metal hydrides and metal oxides, both at low resolution and high resolution, and then I'll go through what we have detected and what we know. 
Um, and so first, um, there's been lots of work at low resolution um, to try to detect these metal hydrides and metal oxides. And here I'm showing you a potential detection of iron hydride in WASP-62, which is a hot Jupiter. And this is from Hubble with C3. And so all of these black points here are the Hubble spectral points. And um, in blue is a model of uh, water. And so you can see that the model of water fits really nicely to these two peaks right here. And so we think that there's water in this planet's atmosphere. But what you'll notice is that the black points don't follow this dip here in between the two water bands. The curve actually stays pretty high. And so um, iron hydride has a opacity that peaks in this area. There's an iron hydride band head. And so by adding iron hydride here, we can actually fit the data much better. Um, and so this leads us to think that maybe there is iron hydride in the atmosphere. And so this is a paper um, by SCAF in 2020, where they actually looked at three different hot Jupiters. Um, but what's difficult about low resolution is that you don't resolve any individual lines. Um, and so it's difficult to tell if um, this peak is best fit by iron hydride or potentially you could decrease the abundance of iron hydride and increase the abundance of a different opacity source, um, like a, a different molecule um, or continuum opacity. Um, for example, here we have a cloud continuum opacity that could potentially be increased, whereas the iron hydride could be decreased. Um, and so that's what makes the definitive detection of iron hydride or any metal hydrides and oxides difficult at low resolution. So you might think that high resolution is the answer. Um, but high resolution has its own pros and cons. And I think that there is a talk about lineless. Um, and so you've already kind of looked at how line lists can affect your results. Um, and so here's just a quick example with vanadium oxide. And so in order to detect um, vanadium oxide, we need a very accurate line list because we wanna cross correlate the vanadium oxide line list or model um, with our spectra. <clears throat> um, and so here is the line list from the PLES group in blue, and here is the newer line list from the ExoMole line uh, group in black. And you can see that the difference between these are pretty significant. So actually even the band head is at different wavelengths and the, the shape of the lines is different in a lot of places. So here you can see um, there's kind of two different band heads where here it's a single band head. And so um, if you cross correlate one line list and um, not the other or vice versa, you would get really different results. Um, and so this is what makes detection of metal oxides and hydrides at high resolution really difficult. Um, and so because of that, I think at this point, it's still unclear if metal hydrides and metal oxides are prominent in exoplanet atmospheres. And I'm not gonna go through this slide in detail. I just kind of wanted to highlight all of the really great work that has been done at both low resolution and high resolution and how many people and papers have um, talked about this. So there's been low resolution tentative detections of a bunch of different metal hydrides in a bunch of different exoplanets from a bunch of different groups here. Um, and we've also got low resolution tentative detections of metal oxides, including titanium oxide, vanadium oxide, and aluminum oxide. Um, but then um, for these uh, different molecules, oftentimes there are non-detections in the same planets with a different data set. And so this has kind of further um, made it difficult to judge how prominent metal hydride and metal oxide absorption is. Um, and then at high resolution, um, we also don't have a clear picture. And so there was a detection of titanium oxide in WASP-33 by Negroho um, in 2017, but recently there's been some follow-up work with um, two different papers where they couldn't reproduce this using different data sets. And so um, I think more data needs to be taken um, and uh, more analysis on WASP-33 to see if titanium oxide is really there. Um, and there's also been many other non-detections of vanadium oxide and titanium oxide at high resolution by a few different groups in a few different planets. 
And so, um, yeah, so at this point, uh, it's, it's, it's a bit unclear. So um, if we see these temperature inversions and we still don't detect metal oxides and metal hydrides, um, what could be happening? Well, there's been a lot of recent work um, saying that potentially temperature inversions could be caused by other things like iron and maybe metal oxides and metal hydrides aren't a good candidate because hot Jupiters, our initial assumption was that hot Jupiters might have um, metal oxides and metal hydrides because they have similar temperatures as brown dwarfs and low mass stars, but they're actually very different um, than self-luminous brown dwarfs and low mass stars. And uh, they have much lower surface gravities um, because a low mass star has a mass of about 100 Jupiter masses, where all of the objects we are looking at have masses of about one Jupiter mass. Um, and so maybe in these lower density environments, there's dissociation of the molecules. So potentially titanium oxide could break up into titanium and oxygen. And also these objects are externally heated, not internally heated. And so these stars that are heating the planets um, are uh, giving off a lot of UV flux. So potentially um, the molecules are being photo dissociated. And the last thing that I wanted to talk about is um, recently there's been a lot of work on um, the potential effect of cold trapping. And so all of these hot Jupiters, they have permanent day sides and permanent night sides because they're tidally locked. And this causes really large um, day to night temperature contrasts. So here's a model showing what um, potentially the atmosphere looks like of one of these hot Jupiters. And the day side has temperatures above 3,500 Kelvin. And the night side has temperatures of about 500 Kelvin. And so what could be happening is maybe some of the um, metals are being trapped on the night side in condensates. And therefore, they're not present in the gas phase on the day side or on the limbs, which is the part of the planet that we probe in our observations. So now I'm just gonna go through a little bit of work that I've done on this field and um, kind of some conclusions that uh, I'm starting to think about um, and what I think uh, the field is moving towards. So um, instead of looking at a single planet and looking for the metal hydrides and metal oxides, we kind of wanted to look for one of these molecules and do it in a parameter space search um, for a lot of different uh, exoplanets. And so we chose iron hydride because there was um, good quality data from the Carmenes instrument that covered many of the band heads. And this data was available for a bunch of different planets. And so we have data from uh, 12 different gas giants that spanned from about 600 Kelvin to 4000 Kelvin. They also have a range in log G or surface gravities and they have different host star spectral types from M to A. So we hoped that by using this larger sample in parameter space, we could figure out where iron hydride was most important um, in, uh, yeah, in some exoplanets. And like I said before, the data is all publicly available from Carmenes, and this is high resolution data sets. So they have spectral resolution of about 80,000 um, and it had already been reduced, so that was really nice. Um, and so I talked before about how important it is to have an accurate line list. And so um, we tested the line list by uh, looking at M dwarf stars and M dwarf stars are known to have iron hydride. And so we could compare a model that we made using the Wendy uh, line list with the Petit Rad trans um, models that you guys have already uh, had some practice with this week. Um, and so in Yellow, I'm showing the observed M7 star, and in purple is the model. And you can see that all most of the lines um, line up really well with both position and depth. Um, and the position is especially good. The depth is a little bit off in some cases, but um, for the most part, the line list is really accurate. And we found that it's especially accurate right around the band head, the main band head of iron hydride, which is around one micron. Um, and this dip here, uh, so sorry, this is um, the signal to noise ratio when we cross correlated 
the model of iron hydride with our M dwarf star. So really high signal to noise ratios mean the line list is really good in these positions. And you can see that there's a dip here in the signal to noise ratio where there's the main water band, um, but there's a second uh, strong iron hydride band between the next two water bands. And so um, uh, with this test, um, we could proceed now that we know that iron hydride line list is good enough for this work. Um, and so you've already had uh, lots of talks about using the cross correlation technique. So I'll just go through this slowly, uh, or quickly. Um, but for each of the 12 exoplanet systems, we basically had data that was time series data taken during the transit of this planet in front of the star. And so um, each of these rows here is a different spectrum. And this is the wavelength region that we are using to get the iron hydride lines. And then we could cross correlate these spectra with the model of iron hydride that I showed you before and remove the spectrum of the host star. And what we would be left with hopefully was the signal from the planet. And so here's a resulting cross correlation matrix where between the red lines is during the transit. And this blue um, feature here should be the absorption from the exoplanet. So you see this as positive correlation between the model and the data. Um, so this is just a uh, injected signal here, and it's a bit exaggerated. Normally, uh, the signals aren't this strong, especially for metal hydrides and metal oxides. So um, in all of our 12 planets, we didn't find any iron hydride detections or any conclusive detections. So these are showing the 1D cross correlation functions where I've shifted all of the ones from last time into the rest frame of the planet and then added them together. So here you should be looking for um, a positive cross correlation value around zero kilometers per second in the exoplanet's rest frame. So you can see that there's really not any strong peaks in any of these. There's two potential peaks around zero kilometers per second, but they're not statistically significant. So maybe if you want to um, look for iron hydride in the future, these are two planets that we could target. And so then we kind of wanted to compare what the data, um, uh, what brown dwarf data can tell us and what how that can inform us about which planets to look for iron hydride in. So here I'm showing you um, parameter space with the surface gravity and the temperature. And I've used models here um, to find the strongest areas where we expect iron hydride to absorb. So right around 2000 Kelvin and at higher surface gravities is where the models predict that iron hydride will have the most absorption. And down here, I'm comparing this to the data. So you can see this is from brown dwarf data. And the data shows the same thing. Right around 2000 Kelvin, um, we have the peak in the iron hydride feature strength. And that for field um, brown dwarfs, so that's higher gravity brown dwarfs, we have stronger features. And what's a bit interesting um, is that the two uh, exoplanets where we had maybe potential like uh, signal to noise three tentative detections actually are in the part of parameter space where we expect the most absorption from iron hydride. Um, and so then we wanted to compare this to the potential detections of iron hydride at low resolution. And so we can do this with injection and recovery tests. So we inject a fake signal into the data, and then we try to recover that. So anything here that's in red, we should be able to recover given the quality of the data. Um, and so here on the x-axis are all the different planets where we searched. Um, and on the y-axis, it's the log volume mixing ratio of iron hydride. So the volume mixing ratio, um, a log volume mixing ratio of minus three, just means one in every 1,000 atoms are iron hydride atoms. And so we can um, rule out any detections of iron hydride with a volume mixing ratio of about uh, minus six in most of our cases. And for some really high quality data sets, um, as low as minus nine and a half. Um, at low resolution, the detections or the tentative detections infer really high abundances of somewhere between minus three and minus five. Um, 
And so this is initially a bit at odds with what our study was saying, because they are inferring really high abundances. So if any of these abundances were present in our data, um, we should be able to detect it. And although we're not looking at any of the same planets, um, it's still a bit, um, it was still a bit worrying that we were getting different answers. But this really nice um, paper came out recently um, by Rathka, and they looked at uh, WAS 79 and saw that if you included um, opacity from H minus, then actually the abundance of iron hydride would be significantly decreased and um, that that fit the data better. So I think that um, by uh, including these op uh, important continuum opacity sources like H minus, the low resolution and the high resolution data are starting to make more sense together. And um, really quickly, I wanted to just um, touch upon a project that I uh, advised a master's student here at Leiden University, um, where we wanted to test the vanadium oxide lineless using M-dwarf stars. And the reason we wanted to do this is because at high resolution, um, in WASP 121 particularly, particularly um, there were many non-detections of vanadium oxide, whereas at low resolution, um, there were many detections of vanadium oxide. And so, um, you know, based on this work, we wanted to see if there was a reason why there was less, uh, or, or we were getting non-detections at high resolution and detections at low resolution. Um, and so um, Sam, the master's student who I worked with, um, uh, used uh, both HARPS data and Carmenes data of M dwarf stars. Um, so here, this is Wolf 359, and here there's Proxima and Tea Garden star. And he injected a signal of vanadium oxide into these stars and then attempted to recover it. And that's shown in the dotted lines. And in the um, non dotted lines, this is what he got when he actually cross correlated the vanadium oxide line list with the M dwarf stars. So you can see that the injected signal is much higher than the recovered signal. If the line list was perfect, we would expect both of these to be exactly the same. Um, so one of the bandheads of vanadium oxide around 580 nanometers seems to be okay. We actually recover a signal, um, I, albeit about half in strength, but we do recover a signal but we actually don't recover any signal at all in the M dwarf star for the band heads around 600 nanometers and around 550 nanometers. Um, and so that's quite worrying. And that would really affect any results where you would be using vanadium oxide line lists. Um, and so um, a paper recently came out by Steph Merritt in 2020, where they looked for um, vanadium oxide and titanium oxide in WASP-121. And um, here's, this is a, um, the plot recreating what Steph did. And so if you inject a signal and then attempt to recover it, you actually find that you can recover pretty low volume mixing ratios of vanadium oxide, um, in some cases down to 10 to the minus eight log volume mixing ratio. And um, here is the low resolution inferred abundance of vanadium oxide, which is about, uh, which is minus 6.6. .6. And so um, this showed that the low resolution and the high resolution were not uh, consistent. But if we scale our uh, vanadium oxide line list to account for the bad uh, line list or the, yeah, so any errors in the line list, we actually um, get a much, a uh, more realistic um, detection of injection and recovery tests. So with this scaled um, injection and recovery tests, we find that we really can't detect any uh, vanadium oxide or we don't expect to be able to detect vanadium oxide given the high resolution data set. And so I think that um, we have to be really careful with both low resolution and high resolution because there's multiple ways where we can uh, trick ourselves into either thinking any, um, any of these metal hydrides or oxides are there or not there. And um, also I'm just looking for uh, 
looking into doing this for lots of other metal hydrides. And it seems like the line list for metal hydrides are pretty accurate, um, especially compared to the line list for metal, uh, metal oxides like vanadium oxide I showed before. Um, so um, yeah, this is something that I'm working on now. Okay, um, so just to conclude, uh, metal oxides and hydrides are everywhere in low mass stars um, and we can easily detect them, but I think the story is still unclear as to whether they're present in exoplanets. And um, I think that uh, the low resolution and the high resolution both have problems and places where we really need to be careful when we infer abundances of these molecules because at low resolution, um, abundances can potentially be overestimated by not including some important opacity sources like H minus. Whereas at high resolution, non-detections can also, can often seem to rule out very low volume mixing ratios of metal hydrides and metal oxides, but we really need to uh, make sure that we know about the accuracy of the line list before we draw any conclusions about whether metal oxides and metal hydrides are present. And so um, I really think that the way to move forward to figure out if these things are there is by both using low resolution and high resolution data together and making sure that we are really thinking about all these different things. And hopefully um, with uh, new line lists that are coming out all the time and high quality data sets, we can finally understand if these metal hydrides and metal oxides are in any of these exoplanets, hot Jupiters that we're looking at. Um, and discovering whether uh, the metal oxides and metal hydrides are there, I think will tell us a lot about um, cold traps and day to night temperature contrasts and the conditions that are happening on these planets. And if we do detect them, we can maybe use them to probe really cool um, parameters like metallicity and weather, cloud dispersion, and even potentially use them to measure magnetic fields on exoplanets from Zeeman broadening. So uh, that's my talk and I would love to take any questions. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions for this time? If not, I have one. Um, so you said that the uh, iron hydride depends not just on the, the temperature, but also on the log G. Now, yeah. is that because as the atmosphere kind of gets squished with higher log G, you kind of probe deeper down where the iron hydride is presumably still, still gaseous? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And all metal hydrides are pretty surface gravity dependent. Actually, this has been known in M dwarfs for a long time. And so um, uh, metal hydride bands are often used to distinguish between um, M dwarfs and M giants. So in M giants where you have very low gravity environments, um, basically there are no uh, uh, band heads of metal hydrides. So magnesium hydride, calcium hydride, those bands basically completely disappear because they're dissociated. Okay. Oh. And uh, are the abundances that we're seeing in these planets consistent with what we'd expect from from solar or are they kind of you know if there is some rain out but not quite all of it is rained out has it kind of has some of it dropped out and the abundance is kind of lower than we expect um yeah so um based on like models from low mass stars um for iron hydride for example we expect the equilibrium chemistry abundance to be somewhere around um, minus seven to minus 10 um, in the log volume mixing ratio space. So um, I think maybe with slightly um, better data sets or maybe like, uh, yeah, uh, higher resolution, larger telescope aperture, um, we can start to probe, really probe the area where we expect the volume mixing ratio abundances of these species to exist. Okay, we've got a question from Matteo. Oh, yeah. yeah, hi, hi, Aurora. I, I was curious about the VO uh, part of the presentation that, that, you, that, you, that you gave. 
Uh, maybe you said it and, and I missed it, but is there any expectation for the volume mixing ratios of VO that we might be seeing in, um, in reasonable atmospheres? Like, so my question is like, is like the 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus six actually a, a, a reasonable number or do we expect way more or way less than that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I definitely think I forgot to say that. <laughs> um, so uh, I think uh, a reasonable um, VO volume mixing ratio would be somewhere between, um, yeah, minus uh, 10 and minus six. And that's just because um, most, of, most of vanadium actually goes into vanadium oxide at the temperatures in equilibrium chemistry, we expect almost all of vanadium to be in vanadium oxide lower than maybe uh, uh, 2,500 Kelvin or something like that. Um, and the solar abundance of vanadium is something around uh, 10 to the minus eight-ish, but maybe if these have slightly higher than solar metallicity, they could be up to uh, an order of magnitude larger. So something around 10 to the minus six to 10 to the minus 10, I think is what we would expect from equilibrium chemistry. Uh, thanks. And, and if I may, like, I don't wanna, if there's any other question, I'll, I'll shut up, but otherwise I have a follow-up. Say it, what should I do? Should I, should I go? Uh, go for it, Matteo. This doesn't yeah. mean uh, anyone else. This this actually maybe maybe bleeds into into my talk, but um, uh, you were talking about uh, constraining the um, uh, basically the limiting abundance via injection and recovery uh, yeah. techniques. But as far as I understand, you're still using essentially the correlation levels, right? Like to 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 do that. Do you see any major degeneracy, say, between the structure of the temperature pressure profile and the amount of VO that you put? And how do how did you account for that? Yeah, so um, definitely there's some degeneracies, and uh, I would really be interested in seeing how uh, you deal with that. So for me, um, I just did a pretty simple thing where I used a bunch of different models, did injection recovery tests and um, tried to span the range of parameters and then included those as error bars here. So this error bar, for example, for hat P32B is huge. Um, and that's because there are some studies that said it had a really high cloud deck and other studies that said it didn't. Um, and so basically this really large error bar is because I used a much larger range in um, uh, cloud parameters here. And this led to much more uncertainty in what I could inject and recover. So definitely the location of the cloud deck, uh, I, I think was the biggest um, uncertainty and that caused the biggest amount of uh, change in what I could inject and recover. Yeah, it makes sense, thanks. Yeah. Okay, uh, we've got a question from Elia. Yeah, just, just to follow up on that point. Um, yeah, I, I think there is a big degeneracy with the temperature that you assume, right? And quite often you would use the equilibrium temperature calculated, whereas I think the equilibrium temperature can be significantly different to the terminated region that you're probing. So I think it's quite important to actually kind of span this diagram along another dimension and actually probe a little bit a range of temperatures to see. And I think that does significantly impact yeah, your, your detection space. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good point that to do this um, more thoroughly, that would be great. I did change the um, temperature um, in order to yeah create these error bars, um, but it's not uh, something that I went too much into detail about here. So nice point. Okay, so if there's uh, nothing else, um, thanks, Aurora. We will now move on to Matteo Brogi, who's going to be talking to us about measuring abundances from high resolution cross correlation spectroscopy. Yeah, thank you, Sid. Let me find the windows to share. Can you, can you see the, the share screen? Yep. Right, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It has been like a brilliant conference so far. Um, and uh, my life has been made easy by all the brilliant talks that, that were before mine who introduced high-resolution spectroscopy. So this is not the first time we hear about that. 
uh, and probably not the last, not even today. Um, and uh, so you heard already how high resolution spectroscopy can be used to essentially find species, both atomic and uh, molecular species. Um, and uh, today, so I'm going to talk about how to supercharge, in a way, the method and try to get something extra uh, than the detection. Uh, and this actually ties very, very well with what we were discussing just in question time and uh, in Aurora's talk. Uh, so how can you actually measure also some abundances and possibly temperatures from exoplanet atmospheres by using high resolution cross correlation spectroscopy? Now, for those of you who have not heard, um, oh yeah, I should also say that uh, Neil Gibson tomorrow is going to give a little bit of a um, um, similar view uh, with slightly different focus on, uh, um, on the topic. So um, if you're interested, in, I, I strongly advise to see uh, Neil's, Neil's talk as well. All right, so for those of you who don't know much about uh, resolution spectroscopy, I'm just going to remind you about the two uh, main features. So the first one, we just heard about it, um, rather than looking at the broadband variations at the spectrum, but as you do at low rest, you start really resolving the dense forest of molecular lines uh, that um, um, essentially um, are characteristic of each molecule. And from Katie uh, yesterday, we heard that thanks to quantum mechanic nature of molecules, each uh, molecular species has a very specific fingerprint. So a very specific set of lines uh, so we can hope if we have enough spectral resolution to be able to match those sets of lines with uh, templates, uh, with all the caveats and uh, uh, challenges that we heard about, um, about being able to model this properly. Um, and briefly get back to this um, if, if there's time later. One way of matching it, as we heard already, is cross-correlation. And I'll uh, also visualize this, uh, this a little bit uh, later. Now, this is only possible uh, with ground-based telescopes. Um, so a, a problem arise, arises here that we have to account for the uh, Earth's atmosphere as well. Um, so we do this um, in many ways, but essentially the second key point that allows us to do that is that the planet is also moving along the orbit while uh, we observe it, especially if, it, if it's a hot Jupiter with just a few days of orbital period. So uh, with enough, enough spectral resolution, whereas the telluric lines that I've shown here on the right side, uh, plot as, uh, um, as dark lines are essentially always stationary in wavelength, so they don't move as a function of time. The planet lines shift, um, and they shift actually by tens or hundreds of kilometers per second, so way above the resolution element of your, uh, say, if you are a resolution of 50,000 and more, you have uh, way enough, we have more than enough to see this happening, even in a few hours of observation. So if you would like to target a Doppler shift in exoplanet signal, you can do that in transmission. Uh, that's conceptually easy to, to, to understand, right? While the planet is transit, we heard about it, the light filters through the atmosphere. So you get not only an extra signature, but also Doppler shift the signature. You can also do it in emission, but this time we are not using the secondary eclipse. We are really just targeting the planet uh, just before or after secondary eclipse. So directly, we are targeting directly the emission spectrum of the planet itself. This allows us, if we want to, to essentially drop the requirement that the planet is transity altogether. Uh, we can do emission spectroscopy uh, from this side of the planet, even for planets that are non-transity. And with the exclusion of directly imaged planets that we heard about yesterday a little bit, um, this is essentially the only way you can try to probe uh, the atmospheres of closing uh, non-transiting exoplanets. You'll see um, in a few slides that this also allows you to solve for the planet mass and the orbital inclination, which is actually a nice uh, side, uh, side product of it. Okay, uh, but you still have this Earth's atmosphere to deal with. Um, I don't wanna go too much into the details and those of you who were around on Monday uh, heard a little bit about that. Um, but thanks to this um, di very different Doppler signature between um, any stellar or telluric lines, which is essentially quasi-stationary or stationary in wavelength, and the shift in exoplanet signal, you can actually apply some uh, quite aggressive detrending techniques that allow you to get rid of everything that uh, comes from the Earth's atmosphere and, um, and very first approximation of the stellar spectrum as well, and be left with everything else which is the exoplanet, the shifting exoplanet signal, um, typically heavily buried into the noise content of the data. 
Um, so this is a process that can essentially auto calibrate the data. You don't need any reference star, um, anything like that. However, there's a trade-off, right? Because we are, you are renormalizing everything to, take, to, to get rid of the telluric and stellar spectrum. Um, you lose both the broadband variations in the spectrum and also any reference level. So you don't know where, uh, what's the absolute level of your continuum. You don't know, say, what the um, overall transit depth of a transiting exoplanet is. All that information is lost. You have to deal with it. There's nothing you can do, uh, you can do with these current techniques to recover um, that. Okay, so the next step is to extract the signal. Uh, you typically have a shifting exoplanet spectrum heavily buried in noise. And you apply cross correlation. So what it means, you've got your noisy data, you've got a spectrum a model spectrum that you think is, is good. We have seen this already in the previous talk. You shift one against the other. You take the product and sum. There's nothing magic. This, 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 this is it. This is it essentially cross correlation. Now you can see what happens uh, with two animated examples. Like if you had an ELT-like observation, say on uh, hot Jupiter. You actually could see the individual spectral lines again um, uh, uh, already. Sorry, so you wouldn't you wouldn't even need cross correlation. But anyway, if you do cross correlate when the model and the data match, you get a very clear peak. Now, in a more realistic observation, say of a VLT-like instrument, uh, the each individual exoplanet line, in this case, we are looking at carbon monoxide lines, for instance, would be heavily buried in the noise. However, cross correlation still works. Um, it finds a way of signal processing to combine all the information of those spectral lines if you have a good template. And you get a peak again when the radio velocity of your template matches the radio velocity uh, of the planet. All right, so essentially you are now finding a way of amplifying your, uh, your overall exoplanet spectrum, which is normally buried in the noise, and you build a cross correlation function which changes as a function of radio velocity and as a function of time, because you are uh, processing different observations taken at different time. Um, now, this is all good and it, it, it looks fantastic. Like if I simulate a, a planet that is 20 times the typical signal of, a, of one of the best odd Jupiters, in a real case, these matrices that I'm showing here will look absolute noise, like you wouldn't be able to see anything uh, at this stage. Um, so what you would typically do is to try to uh, further uh, increment the signal to noise by co-adding in time. Um, now, this is easy if you know exactly what the radio velocity of the planet is, because you just have to pick the right cross correlation value and add in time. But even for, an, for a transiting exoplanet, even for the most precise orbital solutions, this is, isn't known uh, to within a few kilometers per second. So you still have a degree of uncertainty. So what is commonly done in the literature is to essentially try all the different slopes for this radio velocity uh, curve and all the different shifts. So you've got two parameters to play with when you sum the cross correlation function. And then this is, and this is the reason why typically uh, in the literature uh, detections, uh, high rest, they are presented uh, with a two dimensional map. Um, so this two dimensional map encodes the two velocities that I just talked about. So let me reiterate to make, to make it clear. On the vertical axis, essentially you have the radio velocity semi amplitude of the planet itself. This depends on the inclination of the system because it's no other than the orbital velocity uh, times the sign of the inclination. Everything I'm saying now is for a circular, circular orbit, uh, which is a very good approximation for the vast majority of the old Jupiters um, and certainly all, all those we have observed so far. On the horizontal axis, you've got um, the bulk radio velocity of your system as a whole, which is called the systemic velocity. So that's why you've got two, right? One, the horizontal axis regulates the overall offset of your signal and the vertical axis, the slope. So how, how fast the projected radio velocity of the planet is changing. Right, so the, the graph I took was from the first publication where we applied this method um, to a non-transiting planet. This was Tau Bortis B back in uh, 2012. And the nice thing here is that you, now you've got the semi, uh, the radio velocity semi amplitude of the planet radio velocity curve, and the same for the star. So you can take that ratio, and that's the mass ratio between the star and the planet. Uh, and so with the measurement, you can both solve for the uh, orbital inclination and the true planet mass 
for non-transiting planets, which, uh, which is quite good. I'm just putting the numbers there for reference. I'm not really functional to this talk, but if you are curious about the precision that we can get um, with, these, uh, with these measurements. All right, so the state of the art, and then we, are, we'll, we really, I promise, we'll move towards measuring. The state of the art today is that there's about 30 exoplanets observed at high res, um, but there's a bigger potential sample that we'll still have to tap into, even with the current instrumentation, even with the current detection. So without considering tests, without considering the uh, next gen instruments that will be online. And in a decade or so, um, we started with CO, uh, then we detected water. Uh, it took a while to uh, detect or uh, tentatively detect other uh, three species. We had about TIO uh, already. And 2021 was particularly successful because in just half a year, we have three new molecules detected. And from the side of the atomic species, we got, uh, well, um, I had to thank Julia actually, because some of them I missed um, by, by, by listening to her talk yesterday. I quickly updated the table. Uh, the point here, we have a very rich uh, chemical inventory. Uh, what I think is, uh, is good about these molecules is that um, um, they are basically the main carriers under a vast amount of conditions of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So being able to um, essentially detect those and do something about their abundances allows you to tap into the metallicity of the planet because CNO also make up most of the metallicity for most of the planets. Um, what is nice about, nice about the atoms, in my own opinion, is that they generally probe much higher altitudes so they allow you to also tap into the exospheres of the exoplanets and possibly study escape processes, atmospheric escape processes as well. Anyway, this is all good. However, um, for those of you who have not worked with high resolution spectroscopy, a conceptual problem still remains and uh, it remains for me as well, I, I can tell you, is that whereas at low res, you actually produce a spectrum, right? So you have a ground truth, to, to, to think about um, and maybe something to compare models to um, a chi-square away. At high resolution, you only have a level of correlation between a model and, uh, and data. So conceptually, you might ask yourself, how do we even quantify a detection significance? And um, even a, a step later, how do we select, how do we go about selecting uh, models? Right, so this requires a little bit of uh, venturing into how people normally claim detections. The simplest possible approach is the signal to noise uh, theory approach. So you take uh, the peak of the cross correlation as your signal, you take the standard deviation of the noise around that as your noise, you divide the two, and that's the signal to noise of your detection. It's very intuitive to do so. However, some of the noise that you are sampling is not actually noise. It's very likely to be uh, autocorrelation or aliasing of your signal. Uh, also, your noise might depend on where in the two parameter space in the velocity map you are. And if you are at very low signal to noise ratio, obviously, there's always a chance that a signal to noise peak arises by just noise fluctuation. So it doesn't mean really anything. Um, and uh, so, uh, almost exactly after a couple of years uh, from the first detection, uh, a, a parallel method was, uh, uh, was designed where you get back one step. So you take the cross correlation function as a function of radio velocity and time. Uh, and then you, you think about what happens. So if the planet is detected and you take all the cross correlation values that belong to the planet radio velocity curve, you should get a different mean than if you take all the cross correlation values outside of the planet radio velocity uh, curve. So you can do a t-test on these two samples. And what is nice about that is that now you've got a p-value to work with. So you can do the text detection significances, confidence intervals, uh, say in a more statistically robust way. There are some caveats that I'm just going to put there for you to look online. So there has been a uh, um, lot of study around these caveats and uh, um, you can look into the literature if you, uh, if you want to. You can write me, I'll be able to advise. Um, now, the reason why I presented the t-test is because I wanted to uh, kind of present the uh, one sort of unexpected result that came out recently. Um, um, when we were looking at the transmission spectrum of a very well-known exoplanet, HD 209 for 58 b with a modest size telescope, the Telescopio Nazionale Galileo, which is uh, only between quotes three and a half meters of diameter. 
um, we were able to find the signatures of uh, six species, so water plus five containing carbon and, and, and nitrogen. So that was a little unexpected um, and really demonstrates how effective high resolution spectroscopy is to detect species. However, now the question arises, right? Now that you have such a rich chemistry, what do you do with that? Um, because if you just take the detections at face value, you might go wild with all the, um, with all your speculation. You could say, well, maybe this is equilibrium, maybe high C2O, and you don't know. You need really to go beyond detecting in this case and towards uh, measuring something. Okay, so let me uh, get there. Uh, you got on one side your analysis that um, gets rid of the telluric and stellar spectrum. On the other side, your modeling that takes input parameters, does the radiative transfer, and you've got a model spectrum uh, to, to cross correlate uh, with. What do we do with that? If we want to move on, we have to understand whether our analysis is biased in any way, uh, where the information and in high resolution comes from if we want to design something that goes beyond detecting. And then how do we actually detect, uh, sorry, how do we actually design this, uh, this way of, of model selection uh, and possibly exploration of the whole parameter space? So I'll, I'll, I'll touch on uh, each one of these uh, for the remaining uh, part of the talk. So the data analysis, I'm gonna very bluntly telling you that is not harmless. So yes, you can very effectively get rid of the telluric and stellar lines, but that affects your exoplanet spectrum too. So this is hard to see in uh, real data because the data is extremely noisy. So, uh, but it's easy to see if you simulate a sequence. So this is what I'm showing here for, from a paper in 2019 with Mike Lyme. Um, you can clearly see that in the top panel, you've got what we injected in a simulated data set. On the bottom panel, you get what we got at the end of the data analysis. They look similar, so the line positions are all the same, the spectrum is overall the same, but the amplitude, there are, there are changes in amplitude and overall distortions of the spectrum. This happens regardless of the technique that you use to remove telluric lines, um, except perhaps direct modeling through molec fit, which is something that we should explore uh, a little bit uh, more in depth. Uh, Neil Gibson will talk about Systrem, which is one of the many algorithms that you have to remove telluric lines. The key point for you is that every time you alter the shape or the depth of spectral lines, you risk to derive bias abundances and temperatures because abundances and temperatures are encoded in the shape and depth of, um, of spectral lines. So the only way, there's no way around it. The only way of being unbiased is to try to reproduce these effects of each model that you uh, compute via, via radiative transfer. So there's a couple of ways to, of doing this. One is injecting the model on top of the real data and processing it. Uh, the other one is creating a completely synthetic sequence from your model itself. What is important is that now you have to run two parallel chains. One is for your data and one is for your model. And they have to be processed in the same way. At the end of it, you can cross correlate in the end product of that. And now you're back to square one where you have cross correlation function and you still don't know what to do with that. Uh, so the next step is uh, along the list is try to translate this cross correlation into something that is statistically more meaningful, possibly a likelihood function. Now to do that before just going blindly and design that, it's a good idea to try and to understand what is the information content that we can use uh, to do this exercise. Now we have said it already, we got rid of the stellar at telluric spectrum, which is good, but we also got rid of all the continuum in both emission and transmission spectrum. So that's something we cannot use, the level of continuum. Uh, also, we don't have any spectrum visible. So um, this has some consequences because we don't know if a model is the best, is an is a excellent fit Sorry, we don't know if a model is an excellent fit to the data. We just know if a model is better than some other model to fit the data. Uh, this is an important distinction to keep in mind. But we still have the data normalized. So everything is expressed in units of stellar spectrum. So you still have your line to line and line to continuum depth to play with and the line shapes. And it turns out this is enough because line ratios and line shape change with, uh, for instance, absolute abundances and temperatures, but also other atmospheric parameters. 
Here, I'm just showing this is just a toy model, like um, the effects of changing absolute abundances on the spectrum after you have removed all the continuum information from the spectrum. So this is really the information that should uh, use a high spectral resolution. And you see that changing water abundance really changes the structure and the amplitude of the lines in the spectrum. So this is good news. Um, I could show you if I change temperature, the, it would also change the amplitude of the lines, but in a different way. So the degeneracy might be there, but not as uh, stately as we thought in the past. So as long as we can design the right framework, we can try to measure uh, absolute and relative abundances too, obviously, as a side product uh, with, uh, with the right framework. All right, so how do we do this? Um, my checklist, I want to design a likelihood that uses the matching line position, so cross-correlation, for instance distinguishes between positive and negative correlation because I would like to be able to tell whether a spectrum has emission lines or absorption lines and uses as much as possible the information about the shape and the amplitude of the lines. Now, this is something we came up, Mike and I came up with back in, uh, um, in 2019. There are other versions of this uh, and I, uh, you will hear from, uh, from Neil uh, tomorrow a slightly different version. What is important is this like a fairly simple way of combining uh, the information in your data. It just contains three terms. Two terms are the variances of your data and your model. And one term is the cross covariance. If you're asking yourself whether this is similar to cross correlation, it is. Cross correlation is just a, com a different combination of these three. So we have found something that is indeed quite similar to cross correlation as related to. Um, and what is good is that because now we have explicitly the variances, we are accounting for the amplitude of lines and also of the noise in your models. But also because you have cross covariance, which is a non weighted, a non -norm not normalized quantity here, you are also accounting again for the amplitude of the lines. You are penalizing anti correlation because it would change the sign, the sign of the cross covariance. And obviously the cross covariance grows if the line shape matches. So you are also accounting for the line shape. So it all checks. We have found something that is potentially usable. Uh, now let's put it in action. So the first thing that you can do now that you have a likelihood is to simply use it to select models in a grid. So do a likelihood ratio test. And this is actually something we tried for HD209. Uh, we created a grid of models uh, in equilibrium where we varied metallicity and C to a ratio. And we were able indeed to select a specific region of the metallicity and C to a ratio space, which is uh, more compatible, though with quite large uh, confidence intervals uh, with a subsolar metallicity and a slightly supersolar uh, C to a ratio. The other things that we could test, because now we can do model, we, can, we could test different models, right? is that the addition of clouds with the prescriptions from LORES was greatly improving the significance of our models. And that any disequilibrium model that we could try was actually disfavored uh, compared to the whole grid. With this metallicity and C2O, we derive some constraints of the planet formation and early evolution scenarios, which I'm putting there. Um, it's not really important in this context, but remember that metallicity and C2O can be tied for all Jupiters to uh, formation and early evolution scenarios. Now, the completion of this whole process is that it's very hard to create a grid that can account for everything, all the abundances, all the TP profiles, all the cloud parameters, it really becomes, the dimensionality explodes, right? So why not to do it in a fully Bayesian way? Why not to let the data inform how you should move in this parameter space? So you can essentially use this likelihood now to run your favorite uh, um, sampling algorithm uh, for, for your posterior, uh, and this is just very time consuming. I'll, I'll tell you how time consuming this is, because obviously there's a lot of steps which you have to do every time you evaluate one model, but it's doable. And uh, I just want to show you um, one, uh, the latest result has been done a few times, um, but I think this is really exciting. What we saw for one of these hot Jupiters uh, was 77 AB. This is uh, work led by uh, Mike Line and recently accepted on Nature. Um, we went to the Gemini South uh, with an instrument that is called iGreens. 
And uh, this instrument, I, I put some characteristics there, but what you need to keep in mind is just that it covers the H and K band in the infrared simultaneously. So quite a wide uh, spectral range. Um, we targeted this planet uh, just before a secondary eclipse. And you could already tell that something good was going on because um, by just cross-correlating with a equilibrium model, you could see the orbital trail by eye. So I told you before, this is normally not the case. You cannot see the, the orbital trail by, uh, by eye. So this was very good. So we fed the data into the likelihood and produced full posteriors. And this is what we got. I'll guide you through. There's a lot of information here. The first thing we got is bound and tight abundances for both carbon monoxide and water, not, not only one of them as it was done in the past, and only upper limits for the other species. So no evidence in a Bayesian framework of any other species and a decreasing, monotonically decreasing TP profile. Now let me zoom in on those two abundances because when you look at the absolute uh, abundances here in the error bars, these are only a fraction of a DEX. So we ended up having uh, abundances constraints that we think will be possible with GWST uh, with high resolution spectroscopy as well. And we tested all sorts of you know, different fr retrieval framework, different analysis, just to see if uh, these abundances were only, uh, only precise but not accurate but everything was giving us the same result. So as long as the modeling holds, which is the same model modeling that will be fed into the low resolution observations, the results is solid. Um, it only takes an insanely amount, high amount of time to do this. One iteration takes between five and 10 seconds on any CPU single core. So you can, you either have to use GPU computing or uh, parallel CPU parallelization or a combination of, of the two. So you, you've got to do something like to speed this up. Otherwise, it's not really feasible at the moment on a single machine. So with such precision, what you can do is to try to derive the metallicity and C2O ratio. Why is that? Because CO, CO and H2O being the only two species uh, detected are very likely to carry the majority of the carbon and the oxygen atoms. So in this case, you don't need to impose any you know, equilibrium or anything. You just count the number density of C, the number density of O, and you do your C2O and your uh, metallicity measurements here. Uh, and it turns out that um, the C2O is quite consistent with solar, even if you include the processes that are capable of depleting oxygen from the atmosphere. But the metallicity at three sigma is, uh, is subsolar. So how does this compare with the rest of the population or even with the solar system? Well, in the solar system, we got a trend uh, that is called the mass metallicity relation in which metallicity uh, decreases with, uh, um, uh, with mass. And uh, um, in this plot on the right side, you've got the previous measurements from space in gray, and they were mostly all over the, the, the place. And this is obviously very low number statistics, but I'm just showing with such precision now how, you, how confidently you can put the one measurement we have, that was 77, well below that, uh, that line for the solar system. Um, also here, you can do your favorite interpretation. Um, you can try to start connecting this to formation and evolution scenarios. What I would like to stress is 2021 has seen the first three simultaneous measurements of CO and metallicity, and they all came out this year in the first half of the year. So you actually hear about another one of those um, from, uh, from Stefan in uh, one of the next talks. All right, I have I got a couple of minutes left, uh, I think. Um, so I'll uh, wrap up about talking uh, about something that I like very much, which is combining high resolution and low resolution uh, observations. Now, now that we understand that information at low res is encoded in the wiggles in the spectrum and the overall level of the continuum. Um, for those of you who were not around on Tuesday, I really encourage you to see Ryan's and Natasha's lectures because they show what happens if you vary anything you know, as input parameter, what happens to the low res spectrum. That was really, really informative. At high res, um, uh, Sid talked a little bit about that. Um, we only rely on line to line variation, line to continuum variation and line shape. So completely complementary. There's nothing there that is uh, overlapping between the two methods, right? However, they all, sorry, 
they all, all encode the same exact thing. So temperature, opacity sources, pressure, gravity, they're all encoded in both uh, high res and low res. So it seems natural that you wanna put them together. Now I'm just gonna pick one possible effect that is uh, acting differently at uh, low res and high res. This is just for visualization purposes. So what happens if you add clouds and you change their uh, altitude? Uh, at low res, it acts as flattening the spectrum. At high res, as I mentioned before, it acts as changing completely the balance between the weak lines, which are formed uh, deeper, and the um, deeper lines, the stronger lines that are, that are formed higher. So this should work. And um, simulations actually show that they work. Uh, with my client, we simulated a combined uh, cry res and HST spectrum. Uh, and we show that when you were combining the two, um, uh, both metallicity and C2 ratio was uh, greatly uh, uh, improving in terms of error bars. However, the applications, uh, there are few, there's a few applications out there, but they are still very, very rare. And also the objection that I always uh, get from the, from the community is that now if you get such a exquisite precision from JWST and you can also get that precision with uh, say, the VLT or, or ELT, why should we even care? You know, why should we go through the through this combination at all? And well, there's, I think I could come up with endless reasons, but I just want to mention four good reasons to do that. First one is robustness. I show you that if you combine low and high res, you've got the same result with completely independent methodology, independent information, different instruments, and it might even be a test for validity of model assumptions, because um, if some model assumptions break, they might break differently at high resolution and low resolution. So one could still be reasonable, the result. The other one might show something strange. The second one is the error bars. Just reducing the error bars is not a superfluous thing to do, because if you want to do comparative exoplanetology, um, say you want to put more of those planets in the mass metallicity relation, yeah, how big is your error bars really matters here. So it's not like just an exercise to do that. And uh, the, set, the third one is generically reducing possible biases and degeneracy. And I'm just citing two of my favorites, aerosols, so clouds and hazes, and three-dimensional effects, which we heard about already a little bit, and we will hear about, will have different impact on high res and low res. So even if you have the most exquisite 1D modeling of both, once you go to 3D, it might all uh, go nuts. So it's good to have two independent ways of doing that. And lastly, optimization. Uh, scheduling and executing observations from the ground is uh, less costly than doing it from space. So you might think that uh, excellent HR data sets might actually inform future JWC observations and maybe even um, help decide how much uh, uh, telescope time you need to invest in a specific target. So my message is really ground space observations are really in synergy. So don't, please don't think about them being in competition because it's not, uh, this is not the case. Um, this is it. I went a few minutes over. Uh, sorry about that. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Okay, so do we uh, have any questions? Uh, yeah, there's one from Sarah. Uh, yes. Hi, Matteo. Thanks a lot for your great. Hi, Sarah. Um, yeah, I have a question about VAS 77. Um, can yeah. you slide again? Um, Which slide would you like me to put up? Yeah, um, you are leading this uh, project? On uh, no, my client is leading this project. OK, and with, do you know with which instrument is that? Yeah, this is the iGreen spectrograph. Um, which is, is just, the slide is just up. Um, so this is a spectrograph that um, has been designed with a particular technique uh, with a mm -hmm. silicon immersion grating, which allows to keep everything quite compact in, uh, in dimension, 45,000 spectral resolution and simultaneous H and K, and K band. Ah, I see. Okay, it's, it sounds very interesting to me because I have just finished the analysis of this target with Carmenes, so it would be so interesting to compare. 
anything you would like to share about the analysis or, or uh, I, I don't want to. Oh, I did the narrowband analysis of that, not cross correlation. And um, with the narrowband analysis, I see signatures of sodium. I don't know if you have done the uh, sodium analysis or not. No, it, it does. The, uh, the, this one starts at 1.45 microns, so it does not uh, cover the optical at all, unfortunately. So we don't have we don't have the optical. And what is that. super special about this that it is uh, published in Nature? I, sorry, because I have to take care of my child. Maybe I missed. Yeah, the it's it's the level it's the level of uh, uh, precision that we get in the absolute abundances, um, which is uh, really like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 dex. Uh, so this level of precision allows us to really constrain the uh, metallicity and C2 ratio to uh, um, uh, tightly and uh, sort of model independent way in, in, in the sense and put it when put on the mass metallicity trend, it falls uh, significantly below uh, the trend um, that is, uh, say, seen in the solar system. So these are the, the, three, the three main um, I see. Interesting. Thank you. No problem. Okay, next up, we have a question from Ryan. Let me go. Hi, Matteo. Thanks for the, the great Hi, interview. Ryan. Um, so can, can you go back to the slide for a moment with the uh, 0.1 and 0.2 dex abundance positions? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I was just curious, how does this compare to uh, high resolution transmission retrievals? Like, um, g given that this particular model doesn't have cloud clips emission geometry, do clouds yeah. like expand the width of these distributions for transmission? Absolutely. Actually, in transmission spectroscopy, um, um, it, it's it's so preliminary because uh, we are actually working with SID uh, right now on that. Um, the uh, uh, the removal of the continuum level, say like how deep the transit is, um, is introduces very significant additional degeneracies there. So I would expect that if you would rely on the high resolution spectroscopy only, you would uh, actually get back to the situation in which uh, you can probably still do the within one dex. Um, this is what we seem to see uh, from high res uh, alone, but it's really the link to the low res that uh, improves things. So we, we, we've been trying to combine the, the, even the mild you know, inference at low res with the mild inference in high res and because uh, many parameters are in the interdependent now, those uh, just breaking one abundance, for instance, if you manage to, uh, to say to nail down the abundance of water, essentially solves all the rest of the parameter space. Um, so it seems that in transmission, high rest is still, uh, um, is still underperforming compared to emission for doing, for doing abundances. And it, re it, great, it greatly benefits from, uh, from low rest. Uh, and LORES, I guess, does the same um, to essentially try to detect some of the spectral components above the cloud if clouds are a, a really an issue. Uh, but take this with a grain of salt because this is all uh, in progress. Great, thank you very much. Hey, I think we probably have time for one more question uh, from Vatsal. Is that how you say your name? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Hi, Matteo. Uh, thanks Hi, for having talk. Uh, I had a question actually about the fact that you said that uh, in some cases uh, uh, the telluric contamination removal can actually also end up uh, removing the planetary signals. And I'm wondering if this is an effect you would see differently in different uh, uh, wavelength ranges, say, for example, in ranges where you see a much larger telluric contamination. And if that difference is like in some way uh, could be used to quantify or like at least know the limits to which you are removing the signal. Maybe yeah, 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 yeah. No, absolutely. Um, um, with one, um, that's certainly true. Is it, it depends? Like the the fraction will probably depend on how contaminated the the, the region of the spectrum is. Uh, with one of the methods that we have to reprocess the model, which is like the injection on top of the data and in the the complete repeat, basically repetition of the same analysis. Uh, we actually have an opportunity to see this in, uh, in action. So you can say plot the uh, um, recovered, spec recovered model spectrum in each one of the spectral orders of your spectrum. And you would definitely see that in the orders that are more uh, contaminated by tellurics, especially when water is the responsible, because water is the one that is varying more erratically during the nights. Um, the more aggressively you have to go into removing telluric lines, the more uh, you also remove uh, 
planet, planet lines. But the, the planet signal is really not removed completely in any of the cases. What happens is that you end up distorting more and more and more that spectrum. So it's really crucial that you try to reproduce it uh, on your modeling as well, because otherwise you you end up like interpreting the wrong amplitudes and the wrong shape of the lines. Uh, for sure, this is like something I I'll never get back on this. Like it might still work in the optical, but in the infrared, really, it's really necessary unless we find a different way of removing telluric lines, um, and uh, that's not there yet. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Matteo, and uh, and everyone. If you got, uh, there are a couple of other people that had questions. If you want to just ask them on the Slack, um, that might be a bit easier. So uh, we're going to move on now to Bibiana Prinot, who 